Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Hotline Ministry. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you cried out to God with your whole heart? We're going to talk about that this morning. Well, once again, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Hotline Ministry. I am Pastor Harold Noyes, pastor of the Community Christian Church in Athens, Vermont. Alongside is my co-host, Pastor Timothy Golden. He is pastor of Life on Main in Charlestown, New Hampshire. And once again, we want to thank you so much for tuning in and doing this study with us out of Psalm 119. We now are in the 19th stanza of 22 stanzas. And, Tim, we've been watching almost a progression as the, as the psalmist pours out his heart and as he makes great declarations. For example, last week he made a great declaration, Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright in all your ways. So that's a declaration. I mean, he was really declaring, God, you are righteous. Mm-hmm. This week we're going to see that the psalmist is now going and he's, and he's crying out to God. Mm-hmm. My question for us is this. Tim, have we lost something in the church today where we, we kind of lost that sense of crying out to God in desperation or crying out to God with a, with a whole heart? Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like we whimper to him or we complain to him. Mm-hmm. But not really cry out with a with a with a heart that has been broken right. for the lost. Yeah, um, there's not the understanding. I don't think anymore. I think we've we've gotten to know too much. Maybe I remember hearing pastors say once that the problem with the church today is it's educated far above its obedience. And I think in a lot of ways that's what we see happening is there's this aspect where we just, we've so intellectualized God and our um, Christianity that we have lost the importance of that relationship or the understanding of what that relationship really is. Um, we, when we do cry out, it's not usually with, like you said, a heart of desperation that really wants to seek God. You know, it's more of a, I want my way, I want my answers in a way that I can accept. So God, I'm going to cry and I'm going to whine and I'm going to whimper and I'm going to try to do what I can to, though we would never say this, but I'll try to manipulate you the best way that I can to get you to see things my way so that you'll answer my way. Because after all, you're really just my, a Christian version of Santa Claus. Yeah, my Christian genie. Yeah. Yeah. And if I have a need, you're here to meet my need or my wishes. And, and it's not about the fact that he is God, that he is the one who is in control of all things, that he is the one whom we serve. It's not that he is there to serve us. You know, though he has done that through Christ, right? But we have, I think, gotten to this point where we have almost elevated ourselves in some ways above God. We go seeking him, but really we're trying to say, God, see it my way. Not this aspect of God, I'm coming to you, I'm crying out to you because I need you to intervene your way. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm thinking of the scripture verse where it says, um, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Mm-hmm. And maybe there is a lack of joy today in the Christian church and in the evangelical church because we're not willing 
to bow our face down to God and just pour our hearts out to him. Mm -hmm. You know, and therefore we won't reap that joy mm -hmm. knowing that God has heard us and, and God is in charge and God will mm -hmm. do it. Right. Um, you know, and the psalmist goes and he hits on that. And, and it just seems to me that I think if the church has to get back to some of the fundamentals mm -hmm. of the church. Yep. You know, I think sometimes we've become so, so contemporary that we have forgotten some of the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Some of those things, those deep-rooted things that must stay in the church. And one of them, I think, is learning how to cry out for God. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember back after I'd gotten saved, we would have all-night prayer meetings mm -hmm. in my home church. And the church grew and grew and grew. And literally hundreds of people got saved. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's because people then knew how to cry out to God and they weren't watching the clock saying, okay, the hour's up, let's go home. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's, it's, they, they did it all night long and then they went yeah. to work. Yeah, and, and the reason being because it happened the other six days of the week, not just the day that they gathered together corporately when they gathered together for a church service. They were doing it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. Friday, Saturday when they were at home. And then when they came together on Sunday, it was the overflow of what was already present in their lives. Yeah. And I think we get that picture here with the psalmist. This is not something he's doing in the corporate setting. Yeah, it, It's not in the plural form. He's not saying we cry out with our whole heart. Yeah. It's I'm crying out. This is a, this whole psalm, all these... You know, we're, like I said, verse 145 now. All these verses have all been about that personal um, intimacy that he was having with God and through his word and seeking him and pressing in. But it was being done in his personal prayer closet. It was being done at home. I remember growing up, as you and I were talking about earlier, and we, you know, you had those prayer warriors of the church. I'm talking about ladies that would burn the midnight oil, right? you know, and they, they would be on their knees, I think, more than they were on their feet. Yep. And when you needed, you know, an answer and you were seeking God on your own, but you needed somewhere to pray, you knew who those people were to go to. Right. And I'm finding those people are harder and harder to find, where before they were I don't want to say they were commonplace, but you didn't have to search all that much. Every church had quite a few of them. Uh, but anymore, some churches, you're hard-pressed to find even one. You know, you, you read through this psalm in just, just a, a quick pass-through. For example, in verse 25, my soul cleaveth unto the dust. Mm -hmm. You know, he goes there, or, or he goes and says, uh, uh, my soul fainteth for thy salvation. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so he's going, and he knows what it is uh, to, to just lay it all out before God. And in doing so, he was willing even to weep. You know, you know I think that, that scripture verse was, was, you know, the shortest one in the scriptures, right? Jesus wept. Mm -hmm. Why did he weep? Was he weeping for Lazarus? Mm -hmm. I don't think so, because he knew what he was going to do. Right. I believe he was weeping for Mary and Martha, who were hurting so badly because their brother had died. Mm -hmm. And he was crying out for them, and he wept right. for them. I mean, he knew the outcome. Yep. He knew all that was going to happen, but mm -hmm. his heart was just so um, uh, saturated with love for them that he couldn't hold back the tears. He couldn't hold back the weeping for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's exactly when the weeping happened. It was after that interaction that he had with Mary and Martha where he heard the same cry coming from both of their lips, almost verbatim. And, but like you said, it wasn't just that he knew what he was going to do in that moment. He knew long before. Yep. When he first received word of Lazarus being sick days before, he knew, no, we need to stay put so that he can die, so that I can go specifically for this reason, so that I can raise him from the dead. Yep. I mean, he knew that was the plan from, day, from the get-go. But like I said, once he got there and after he had that interaction with Mary and Martha, that is when that... And it's not only with them that you see that compassion hit. You see that over and over again throughout the gospel accounts where it says that he was moved with compassion yeah. for the people. I mean, his heart was so breaking for them. You know, and I was thinking, you know, him knowing, he knew what he was going to do with Lazarus. He knew that he was going to call them from the dead. Mm -hmm. But also knowing, well, here's an incident where Mary and Martha were going to be, have to be taught um, a, a, what is it, 
just taught not really taught a lesson so so to speak mm -hmm. but that's the all i can think about this time they had to be taught trust me believe me mm -hmm. you know that kind of thing and it took the death of their brother and the resurrection or mm -hmm. the coming forth of the brother to see yes truly mm -hmm. jesus is the lord thy god right you know so in in doing that i mean it broke his heart to have to teach him that lesson mm -hmm. but he had to do it because he loved them so deeply and so yep. hard. I'm going to open in prayer, and then I'm going to ask Pastor Tim to read verses 145 to 152. This is of Psalm 119, and we'll get right into the scriptures. So let's bow and ask the Lord. Father, we thank you so very much for the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And Father, we thank you so very much that, that you hear our cryings. You hear our yearnings. You hear our groanings, Father, unto you when we just don't know what to say, don't know how to say it. But your Holy Spirit can take those groanings and make them beautiful to your ears. Father God, teach us, help us as a church to know what it is to weep before you. Weep in, in, in joy, but also to weep in, in uh, having compassion for people and wanting to see you work. Mm -hmm. So Father God, bless Tim and I, Bless the hearers and those who watch this program. Use this for your glory, to your praise, and we'll thank you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So the scripture says, starting at 145, I cry out with my whole heart, hear me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I cry out to you, save me, and I will keep your testimonies. I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. My eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. O Lord, revive me according to your justice. They draw near to who follow after wickedness. Wickedness, They are far from your law. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them forever. So several times here now that the psalmist goes and he says... I cry unto thee. You know, to me, that is just so important for us mm -hmm. to know that, you know, God, God desires us as his children to come and, and cry unto him, to say, Lord, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do it. Today in our world and in our society and in our culture, I mean, it seems to me that it should be driving us to our knees. Mm -hmm because of all that we're seeing and, and, and all that is happening. And, and, and I don't see that happening. No. You know, and, and it really, to me, the church needs to get back to that. And I'm talking to me, Harold Noyes needs to get back to mm -hmm. that. Yep. So many times we want answers, but we fail to realize, as the old song, I think it was by Andre Crouch from back in the 70s said, Jesus is the answer, yep. right? In fact, the, the chorus of that song that he had written had said this, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way, you know? And, and it's, you hear this cry really from the psalmist. It's this understanding that I am, I am basically doomed. Yep. You know, I, I am at a total loss. I am, am of total weakness right now. And if there's going to be any hope for me, it's only going to be found, God, in you and in you redeeming me, you, you, you saving me in the midst of the situation that I'm in. So, God, I'm going to trust you with it all. Or actually, even better, oh, Lord, I will trust you with it all. Because that's what you hear him refer to him as in this passage is Lord, not God. Yep. You know, and, and that, that, carries with it this aspect of, I am your servant. Right. Yeah, he's I, I, I am submitting myself fully to everything that you know, but I know that on my own, there's no hope here. But God, I trust you with it all. You know, I, I look at that, that, just that little phrase, I cried with my whole heart. Mm. Or verse 146, I cried unto thee. You know, and once again, this is just in, in absolute desperation. Lord, I'm laying it all out. Mm -hmm. Here I am, crying out to you and, and, and just seeking your face. You know, that, mm -hmm. I, I really think, we, once again, I, I, as I've been reading this, I look at it and I say, we need to get back there mm -hmm. to where we see him for who he is. We see ourselves for who we are. Mm -hmm. And I'm desperate. Yep. You know, 
and, and you've, you've already alluded to that, that it's just one of those things where, Lord, without you, I'm nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, without you, I'm dust. I mean, it just, so I cried out, but he did it with his whole heart. He, he did it with all that is within him. Mm -hmm. You know, from the innermost parts of him, from the depth of his bowels, if you will. Mm -hmm. He cried out to God. It, it, I, I look at it, you know, and I like, to, I like to do pictures in my mind. I look at it as if I cried out to you until it hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and done that. And, and I was thinking several times that, that in my Christian experience. Now, I've been, I've been a Christian now for 52 years, almost 53 mm -hmm. years. And I can probably count in both hands the times that I can remember where I was that desperate. Mm. You know, and I just absolutely bawled in front of him, if mm -hmm. you will. I mean, I just wailed because it was just something that overtook me. I just, it was more than I could bear. Mm -hmm. more than I could stand. You know, I remember one time uh, I lost a niece, a, a little baby girl died, uh, Heather Elizabeth, and, and I was a brand new believer, just brand new. And that's back when the churches would keep the doors unlocked, you yeah. know. And, and I went to my home church, and I just newly saved, and I just went to the altar, and I just cried and cried and cried, you know, and, and because I was just beside myself. Lord, why? Mm -hmm. Why did you take this little baby? Why did you do this? You know, um, and then when I thought about the fire and God taking the girls and, and left me to live and took them, uh, there were many, many times that I just wailed to God because I just didn't understand. I could not comprehend mm -hmm. God's mind. I could not comprehend God's heart. And it seems to me that the psalmist is there in, in 145, 146, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and because he just goes and he says, with my whole heart, I, I have just, I, I'm desperate. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't know which way to turn. Yeah. I don't know where to go. I don't know. Yeah. What are the answers? Mm -hmm. But yet I know that in your word is where my hope lies. Yeah. Is where you know, the one thing we do see that he does not do in this entire time, even though there's a lot of crying going on, yeah. right? Because he says that numerous times. <clears throat> The one thing you never see him do is blame God. Blame God. Nope. You know, and the closest that you could find and to, to this is all the way down in verse 150, where he says, they draw near who follow after wickedness. Yep. He never, he's, he doesn't talk about God, why are you doing this to me? Or why are you allowing this to happen? It's this aspect of, look, the situations I find myself in is because there are these people who are choosing of their own accord to follow after wickedness. Yeah. And that is what's bringing this. So God, will you intervene? You know, and you know what I find so interesting? And, and I think what, what has made this psalm so beautiful to me, this whole psalm, and this section here is when he goes and he said, for example, in verse 50, they are far from the law. I interpret that as they're so far from you and my heart is broken yes. for them. You know, mm -hmm. and, and today we can look at our culture and our world and say, there are so many people that are just so far from God. God is the last thing they think about. You know, and when they yeah. do think about him, they have nothing good to think about. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and, and that broke his heart. Yeah. And are we there yet? Mm. where, you know, I mean, both you and I believe that the rapture is going to happen soon. Mm. It could happen before we close off this program. Are we so concerned about those who are going to be left behind mm. during that time that we wail before God or we cry before yeah. God and say, Lord, you know, these people are going to die and go to hell. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an eternity mm. that... You know, nobody wants to face. They think right. they do because they think they're going to party and, and have a blast and, mm -hmm. and do all. But believe me, the scriptures are very clear. They are not going to be partying. It's not going to be a blast. Right. It's not going to be a fun time. Um, you know, they're going to be in darkness forever. They're not even going to know that anybody's around them. And, you know, but th does that break my heart? Does that mm -hmm. break the heart of the believer today where, where we cry out for the world and cry mm -hmm. out for the lost? Right. You know, and it seems to me, I mean, he's crying out, I think, for his own personal needs. But then in verse 50, 150, though, he seems to include them. Mm -hmm. You know, where he goes and says, they draw nigh that, that follow after mischief. They are far from you. Thou art near, O Lord. I love that. 
Because what that portrays to me, and it wasn't until probably about the tenth time I read through this section, through, through mm -hmm. this passage as we were preparing for today, the difference between 150 and 151, they draw near, but you are near. Yeah. You know, it's like they're coming close, but gee, but but Lord, you're already here. You're already there. You're already here next to me. You see this coming, you, you understand it, you're sensing it, you're experiencing it right along with me, so I cry out to you now. Yep. You know, I had the privilege this week, Tim, to to share with a man whose wife is, is dying, and he was weeping and crying, and, and, you know, because of the emotion of it all and all that is happening. And he made a statement to me, and he said, Pastor, I'm going to lose her. And I was able to put my arms around him and said, you don't have to. And he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? I said, your wife knows Jesus Christ as her personal savior. She has committed her life to him. Mm -hmm. I know that. She told me that. If you commit your life to Jesus Christ, guess what? You won't have to lose her. Oh, you may be separated for a short time, but then you can spend eternity with her. But you need Jesus Christ. And he, and he went on to say, well, I'm of, of this group, and, you know, we have many gods and all that. I said, no, Jesus Christ is the only one. You need to proclaim Jesus Christ as the only God. At the end of our conversation, he looks at me, and with a loud voice, Jesus Christ is God, period. Mm. And I trust him. Mm. And I said, if you really believe that, yeah. then you will only be separated for a short time. And then you will have a grand reunion in heaven with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was on the way home. I was praying for him and, and wondering, did he really grasp it? Did he really get it? Mm -hmm. I got two texts from him a day, two days later. Okay, one one day, one one another. And, and the first part of his text is, I thank you that you brought me to Jesus. Mm. And Jesus is here with me. Uh -huh. You know, what a, what a joy that is. Yeah. You know, to know that there are still people who want to know Jesus Christ as their mm -hmm. personal Savior. Yeah. You know, and, and he was crying in desperation. Lord, what am I going to do? I'm going to mm -hmm. lose my wife. I'm, you know, the woman I love. And, and, you know, she's such a big part of me and all this. And, mm -hmm. well, Jesus can come and, and, and heal that. Not do away with the pain, mm -hmm. but, but heal it. That now you can at least look into the future and say, okay, we'll be separated for a while but not too long. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to be with her one day. Yeah. And that is, that is the desperation. And, mm -hmm. I, and I see that desperation in the psalmist yeah. as he writes this. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not only for himself because they're coming and attacking him because they're non-believers, but I also think he is praying for the non-believers. Mm -hmm. In verse 151, thou art near. Yeah. If they only call on you, Lord, they'll find you too. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and so I, you know, I was looking at that and saying, wow, you know, what a heart, what a heart yeah. the psalmist has. Because he had that relationship not just in the bad time. Yep. See, how many times have we run into people, and I'm sure the people watching, tuning into this that could identify as well, that there's people in our lives that we know the only time they seek God is when things start to fall apart. But the reason why the psalmist was able to stay so true, even though you see this crying, you see this, this desperation, you also read throughout this that he knows where his anchor is. You know, there's all this stuff happening. I'm desperate. I, I'm at a loss here. But yet, in the midst of the storm, I'm firmly grounded. You know, and you see that over and over through the... I'm keeping your statutes. I will keep your testimony. I hope in your word. I meditate on your word. That's talk about his level of commitment. Yep. Beca and why? Because he has seen his God bring him through. You know, he's brought him through the good times. If he was there in the good times, he'll be there in the bad. But if we're not seeking him in the good times, when the bad times come, the only time we're going to real, the only way we're going to seek him out is to try to find a solution to our problem rather than finding the solution himself, which is Jesus Christ. Do you think that maybe there is a commitment problem today? And I hear you. you know, because it, it really just seems to be. Because as we read through this, this stanza of this psalm, he goes and says, I cry to you with my whole heart. I will mm -hmm. what? keep your statutes. I will, verse 46, 146, 
keep your testimonies. I hoped in your word. I might meditate on your word, and, and so forth. And you know, so we go, and he says, you know, it's it's all about being committed. And when he, when you're so committed, it's easy then. And I say easy, not in the laughing, but easy in the sense of, it's a whole lot easier to go to the one whom you love and go to the one who loves you and cry out to him. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a child skins his knee to his father, mm-hmm. and his father says, ah, rub it off, rub it off, rub it off. What does he do? Then he goes and goes to his mother, and the mother says, oh, let me take care of it, and she washes it out, and she puts a little Band-Aid on it, and she does, you know, that kind of thing. You know, and that's what we, we as believers need to do. We, we go to him because we love him and we're committed to him. Mm-hmm. And, Lord, I do not see... In these verses, 145 through 148 and 49, I do not see where he says, I cried unto thee, therefore I have to keep your statutes. Mm-hmm. I cried unto you, therefore I have to hope in your word. No, he's doing it, why? Because he mm-hmm. wants to. And he yeah. knows that that is where his help is going to come from. Mm-hmm. Psalm 121, right? My help comes from the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. Mm-hmm. You know, He neither slumbers nor sleeps, and so forth. And He will mm-hmm. keep Israel. And and you yeah. go with that, and you see it, and wow, it's mm-hmm. just so neat. Well, I think the great picture of that, especially we see in verse 148 of His commitment: "My eyes are awake through the night watches, that I may meditate on Your word, not that I may seek an answer." so that I can understand you, so yep. that I can understand your ways. That's, but I, I, will, I will sacrifice whatever. Even when in my flesh I just want to sleep, yep. I'm going to still press in. I'm still going to seek you. And so you see that determination, the motivation, the commitment that he had um, that, yes, I'm calling out to you, but God, I'm also going to do everything I can to press in more to you. You know, we've been going through the Psalms of Degrees or the Psalms of Ascent, um, in, in our two uh, Sunday night Bible studies. And last Sunday we went through Psalm 130. Uh, mm-hmm. Tim Groose led our, led our group. And I couldn't help but think of 130 being tied in with this portion of 119 because it goes out and says, Out of the depth have I cried unto thee. Mm-hmm. Lord, hear my voice. Let the ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. You know, and, and so he goes and, and, he, and he sees that and he, and he looks at that and, and it's out of the depth. Mm-hmm. You know, I am in desperation. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, you know, I think sometimes God, God allows desperation to come into our life mm-hmm. so that we will come running to him mm-hmm. and crying to him and, and seeking him out. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I just think that he does that because he, he loves us so much. Mm-hmm. He wants to draw us into that love relationship again, in which we, we once had. Right. You know, into, into that intimacy. Who, so he goes and says, all right, I cried with my whole heart. So not just a half a heart, not just a half-hearted whimper. Mm-hmm. You know, no, I cried with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord, I will keep. I cried unto thee, verse 146, save me, deliver me, and I, and I shall keep your Testament. Now, what do you think he's deli- being asking God to deliver him from? That's a good question. Not a yes, no question. Yeah, no, right? it's not. And that's what I was looking for. So yeah. oh, I could answer that with a yes, no, but I can't. So, yeah. um, I mean, we, he's not obviously talking here about, you know, the salvation that Christ brings, because this is Old Testament right. yet. But it's this aspect that, again, I, I think it, based on the verse that you had read there from that other passage, there's this aspect of I am sinking here. Yeah. Uh, you know, in myself I am lost, but you and you alone can rescue me. It's just this simple aspect yeah. of rescuing me and, and being my provider, being my refuge, being my strength, as we hear throughout a number of the other Psalms, right? And be what I need for me to remain safe and secure in you. Yeah. And there again, it's not safe and secure from my circumstances. It's safe and secure in you is what I ultimately want. You know, I'm looking at, and once again, going over here to Psalm 130, in verse 5, it goes and says, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. Mm. You know, here he is, he's crying out to God, asking God to deliver him from whatever it is that has overwhelmed him. Mm-hmm. And now 
you know, the psalmist goes in 130 and says, I wait for you. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and my soul, the innermost part of me does wait. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not just the tangible, not just the physical, but the innermost part of who I am mm -hmm. has learned to wait for you. That's right. And, and, and then, then, you know, it's just so neat because in 130, it goes and says, but there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. That you mm -hmm. may be loved, that you may be respected, right. may be honored, and then he goes also in this verse where he goes and it says, um, "The Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with Him is plenteous redemption. Mm -hmm. There's enough to overflowing, yeah. and it keeps on overflowing. It's like that fountain that just never runs dry. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the psalmist in Psalm 119, 145 down through." is knowing God's mercy, knowing God's redemption is plenteous, knowing he may mm -hmm. have to wait for it, but he's willing to do that. And while he's waiting, he's pouring his heart out to mm -hmm. God. Yeah. You know, and, and, and knowing that God will hear his voice. Yeah. You know, hear me, O oh Lord, 145. He, he, you know, he cries that out. He did the same thing in, verse one, uh, in chapter 130. Hear me, you know. I cried, I hoped in thy word. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate. What do you think mm -hmm. he means? What does yours say? 148. I have the word prevent the night watches. Um, mine says my eyes are awake through the night watches. Yeah. So I can't sleep. Right. Right? It's, mm -hmm. it's almost like, like, you know, here I am, I'm standing guard. Yep. And I think it's even, <clears throat> even deeper than that because if I combine that with 147, I rise before the dawn of the morning. Yep. Then my eyes are awake through the night watch. One could say that, yeah, you know, when we're under stress, we have a hard time sleeping. And that's true. But what I'm hearing in these two verses is I know that as the day gets going and everything that's happening, it's going to draw my attention here and it's going to draw my attention there. And I am at such a loss and I so need you. I know my best times to hear you is when everything else is quiet. Yeah. And when is the best time for that? If I rise before the dawning of the morning and if I'm actually allowing myself to stay up during the night watches. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, that's in the stillness, right? Be still and know that I am God, the scripture tells us, right? And so I, I kind of get this picture of him. I know that's my best place to, or best time to hear you, so I'm going to do that. I, I know with, um, with my wife, for instance, for her... And, I don't know if she'll be watching this or not, but if she does, forgive me, honey. Um, but I'm the same way. Sometimes the best place that I hear him is in the shower. Yep. And I know it's same for her, right? But why? Because my wife is a type A type personality. And it's the only time that she's forced to not do anything yep. else. You know, yep. she can't do anything else when she's there. So she's like, I find that God talks to me more there. Yep. And, of course, the truth is, is, is he really talked to her more there, or is it just that we're quiet enough there to actually hear him? Key. You yeah. know, and I think that's what he is saying here is, I know I've got to get myself in that place where I am quiet enough so that I can actually hear you, because once things get going, that silence isn't going to be there to focus. So, and, and I find in my, own, in my own life, okay, I find that, um, that the best time for me and once again, this is just what I do. I'm mm -hmm. not saying everybody has to do it. You don't have to follow my example. But the first thing I do, even before I do anything else, before even shaving or whatever, I go downstairs to my office and I get into the Word. You know, I read the Word. I listen to a message or two mm -hmm. from favorite um, pastors and, and so forth. And, and I just spend an hour of just simply listening. To me, that is the best way for me to start mm -hmm. my day. It is quiet. I don't have to worry much about the phone ringing at 5 a.m. or 5.30. And therefore, it's a quiet mm -hmm. time that I spent. Same thing just before I go to bed. As I go and I spend my quiet time. 10.30, 11 o'clock, don't mm -hmm. have to worry much about the phone ringing, just, you know, disrupting. Spend time with him. And, you know, so when I read this and this, I said, yes. 
mm -hmm. know, he and I are alike here. Yeah. Well, it's so powerful because you just stop and think about the way we are. And I think of Bill Hybels, um, who uh, has on YouTube, there's uh, a video that people can watch called Coffee Coffee Time with God or Coffee with God, something like that. And, and he shares a, a situation there. It's about nine minutes long. But during that, he, he makes this one point. He's like, isn't it amazing that when you spend time with a friend, even if it's only five minutes, you tend to think about them more throughout that day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a natural tendency. And it's the same thing with God. You know, if we can start off our day, you know, and I'm not saying let's get religious about it, but if we can take some point early in the day, even if it's only five minutes, yep. just to focus on Him, read the Word, you know, listen to some praise and worship, whatever, but whatever helps you draw close to Him, you will tend to think about Him more throughout the day. You know, and, and you'll find that'll go with you during the day. But the cool thing is, is also when we take time in the evening to give him some time there as well, what happens is, is even though our day has come to a close, what we know about the human brain is that when we sleep, we tend to take the things of the day and our brain starts to sort those things through and begins to put them in proper places. And so if we take time just before we go to bed also to focus on Him, what that does to put everything of our life of that day into proper context. So as the brain begins to sort through the stuff, mm. you know, it's sorting through the Jesus stuff in the morning and the Jesus stuff at night yep. as well. And it's like, God, help me through the day when you start, but at the end, it's like, God, thank you for being with me through the yep. day. Yep. You know, I was reading out of 1 Chronicles 20, and the first 20 or 25 verses of 1 Chronicles 20, and I came to the conclusion that I am to praise him before the storm. Mm -hmm. I, am pra I am to praise him during the storm, mm -hmm. and then at the end, I am to praise him after the storm. Yeah. And... That's exactly what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Before the storms of the day comes, mm -hmm. I'm to give him praise. I'm to spend time, I'm to worship him. Mm -hmm. During the storm, I am to give him praise, worship him. After the storm, give him praise, worship him. Mm -hmm. I need to praise him at all times. Yeah. And and you know, and I and I was just so amazed at, at you know, listening to or reading in Chronicles about Israel having to do that or desiring to mm -hmm. do that. One forty nine Tim, as we look at this, hear my voice according to thy loving kindness. I look at that and say, I really sense the psalmist saying, look, in me, you would have no reason, reason to listen to my voice. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just a mere mortal. I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. I break your commands. I go against you. There's times I forget about you. This, you know, and all that. Yeah, Lord, in your loving kindness, mm -hmm. Would you listen? Would you mm -hmm. hear me? You know, because of who you are, not because of who I am, mm -hmm. or despite the fact of who I am, mm -hmm. but in your loving kindness, listen, please. Yeah. Well, but we also know as well through Scripture that, you know, I believe it was Jesus that also said that, you know, there's no one more um, deaf than he who does not want to hear or blind yep. than he who does not want to yep. see. Yep. And, and he talked about, you know, even as we're going to be getting into in our next series, as we get into the churches of Revelation, um, how many times does he end those each of those others with, let he who has ears, let, let him, him hear. hear. And what he's saying isn't just, let him who has ears actually listen to me. It's allowing yourself to listen to the point that it, it facilitates and it, it prompts action. Yep. And so what I hear him saying here is, God, hear my voice, but don't don't just listen to me. God, would, would what you hear from me prompt you to an action that is in accord with your loving kindness? Yep. So in, in other words, I know I only see my part. I, I only see my comfort piece. But God, your loving kindness looks at not just me. You're looking at eternity. You're looking at other individuals. So God, hear my voice, hear my cry. But God, you put it in your context. And, and I think also, again, of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Yeah. Father, here's what I, I don't want to drink this cup, but not my will, but yours be done. It's that same concept. Here's my voice. Here's my desire. But let it be according to your word. Let it be according to your will. Yeah. You know, and I like the end of 149 where he goes and says, Hear my voice according to your loving kindness, 
And then it's almost like he's asking God, do something about it. Mm. Make me alive. Quicken me. Mm. Make your voice alive in me. Mm. You know, and, and I asked the people last week, you know, when Stephen goes and says, and God spoke. Mm -hmm. So I asked the people on Sunday morning, how many of you believe God speaks today? Mm. And how has he spoken to you today? Right. You know, because there's so many modes in which he can use. He can use your prayer time. He can use your Bible reading. He can use another brother or sister. He can use a worship song. He can use a message. He can, many ways God can use to mm -hmm. speak to you, but he wants to speak mm -hmm. to you to make you alive. That's right. And however he speaks to you through all those other avenues, every one of them will line up with the Word. Exactly. Exactly. None will ever, ever, ever deviate from the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So he goes and says, when you speak to me, I want to become alive in that. Yeah. I want that to make me alive. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and it, I, it's and kind I, of like that concept of, I don't want to just survive, I want to thrive. Yeah, it's that's really it. what he's calling yeah. for. I don't, I don't want to just exist in this. I want you to revive me the point that true life is really yeah. reigning. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, yeah, I, don't want any, I, I just don't want the, the veneer. Mm -hmm. okay? There's too many people with the veneer. Yeah. And tear the veneer off. Mm -hmm. Just make me real. Yeah, you know, and I and I really think that that's that's what really has to happen to all of us, mm -hmm. and because we're not real, and let me let me just say this: because we're not real right mm -hmm. now in our worship to Him, we can't cry out to Him. Right. We refuse to cry out to Him. I can handle this. Mm. I can lead my own way. I can do it my way. I can. I can. I can. No. And God says no. I will. If I have to, I will break you. Right to where you have to cry out to me. Mm -hmm. And it's not break as in shatter like a piece of glass. Yeah. It's break like you break a horse Yeah, is really what he's doing. Yeah. It's breaking your will so that he, who's, he who sits on your back yeah. can lead and guide you where, where you need yeah. to go. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, you know, and, I, and to be honest with you, I just think that that's exactly what the psalmist is talking about. Then he goes and says, they draw nigh that follow after mischief, they are far from thy law, but thou art near. Mm -hmm. And I really like that. And you've already pointed this out, Tim, but I really love that because here's where they are, but here's where you are. Mm -hmm. And I want to be here with you. Yeah. I don't want to be out here with them. Mm -hmm. You know. And, and I think we need to choose who we keep company with wisely. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. I really do. I mean, he could have he chosen to run with those who were in mischief. Mm -hmm. All of us like to get into mischief. I know mm -hmm. I do. And I used to really a lot. Yeah. And, and kind of think, but you know something? Wait a minute. I, today I'd rather run with him. Mm -hmm. And it's not, and I know that you have the same mindset. Um, this is not to be, take, don't take what we're saying as an excuse to just stay in your holy huddle. Yeah. Right? Because too many times we have people that are like, okay, well, I can't associate with this one or I can't associate with that one because they are not walking with the Lord. I, I'm just going to be around the church people. In fact, you'll find that they state that when a person comes to know the Lord, within five years they have no unsaved friends. Mm. And that's for one of two reasons. Either one, they went out and ended up getting all their friends saved, but nine times out of ten, it's the reverse. What happens is yeah. they do away with all those just to gravitate towards the church and towards church people, which we need. There's a lot of junk in the world. That the only way we're going to combat it is by assembling together, right? And Scripture said not to forsake that. But we are also not to forsake those that are out there because if we are not amongst those that are in the world, how will they know him Right. unless they hear, right? Yep. And so we've got to be able to go there. But not at the expense that we put ourselves in jeopardy uh, because we are just because we are hanging out there and thereby not getting the life flow that we need that can only come through the through God himself and through the church you know one of the things that we find and, and a lot of people get hung up on this Jesus went and he ate with publicans and sinners yep now let's make the truth clear he ate with them he did not partake of their sin. Right. And that is, why did he eat with them? Because he wanted to show them who he is. Mm -hmm. You and I are permitted to go and eat with them mm -hmm. without participating in their sinfulness. Right. But it's got to be with the motive of 
how can I show them Jesus? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that... And yes, we need to love people where they are, but we do not have to condone right. those behaviors. Jesus, I love the story of Zacchaeus. Yeah. Right. Where or the the account of Zacchaeus. Thank you. Um, well, <laughs> I, I love I, that word account. I, I know. I, I I'm with you. The the word story has been restricted down to this aspect of fairy tales. I yeah. just don't like that. Yeah. And, no, um, I agree. Uh, but the account of Zacchaeus, when he looks at him, tax collector most hated type people in that culture by the Jews of that day, next to the Roman soldiers, probably even hated them more than the Roman soldiers. He's in a tree. Jesus is walking with a crowd, not of everybody that's trying to be close to him. He just looks to Zacchaeus and says, hey, come down, let's go to your house, let's eat. Yeah. Which, number one, in that society was taboo. Yeah. Because if you were to f eat with somebody, that's say, I identify with you. Mm -hmm. And, but... What happens as a result of him going to his home? We never hear anything about a message being preached or any kind of condemnation or him taking him aside trying to point out his sin. But because he was around holiness, yep. what happens is Zacchaeus gets convicted in his very heart and makes right his life and, and begins to actually pay restitution. And even far and above mm -hmm. what he had to pay. Right. I mean, he, he would even go up to three times to mm -hmm. five times more mm -hmm. than what he had to pay. Yeah. And so and I think that's a good um, benchmark for us to take a look at is if we are spending time with those that are not believing, when we are done with them, are they just maybe one step closer to Jesus yeah. than they were before? Or by my hanging out with them, am I one step closer to where they are? Yeah. You know, and, and if that's the case, maybe we need to back, back off and get around some other believers and get back into the Word again. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Do you think I'm spiritualizing this in verse 151, where he yes goes and, and no. says, Yeah, yes no. and no, right? <laughs> where he goes and says, Thou art near, O Lord, and thy commandments are true. If we go as we are told to go, and we live as we are told to live, is that going to rub off onto those around us? Or should it rub off on those around us? I think the answer yes is and yes. yes. <laughs> because thy commandments are true. Mm -hmm. He commanded us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Why? Of none effect? Mm -hmm. That it's just a bunch of empty words? No. Yeah. It's not empty words. It is truth. It is power. And therefore, it may not happen today like it did yesterday with my friend, mm -hmm. with, this young, with this man. But it may happen. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I'm really seeing this. God, mm -hmm. when I step into the crowd, who's there? You are. Mm -hmm. When I go meet with these people, who's there? You are. Mm -hmm. Right? So how many of us really recognize the fact that no matter where, excuse me, where we are, who's there with us? Mm -hmm. He is. All so right. we better be careful where we take him. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, do I want to grab a hold of Jesus' arm and pull him into some sinful place where I ought not to be? Mm -hmm. Of course not. Not that he's not big enough to take care of that, but just the fact, why would I want my holy God? And why am I there? Yeah, and well, so why am I there? If Jesus wouldn't go there, mm -hmm. maybe we better be careful. Yeah. You know? So, you know, just, just a thought. Mm -hmm. Just a thought of, yep. you know. So, you're, you're with me where I go. And your commandments are always true. Verse 152, concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them for how long? Forever. Forever. So when we tell, this, when we tell the accounts, the New Testament accounts, mm -hmm. or as Stephen did in Acts chapter 6 and 7, mm -hmm. he gave the accounts of Israel and the, a wonderful, I mean, dynamic history of Israel. Mm -hmm. But every so often he would, he would put in these words, and God spoke, or mm -hmm. God kept his promise, or God was faithful, or God did this. He said, kept on saying, look, this is what happened to Joseph. But guess what? God was with him. Mm -hmm. Don't lose sight. God was with him. Yep. You know, when he was in Egypt, guess what? God was there. Mm -hmm. By the way, who put Joseph in Egypt? God did. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so that kind of thing where, where wait a minute, wow. Mm -hmm. If we can walk our lives that way, yep. where I am, what I do, what I say, who I hang out with, guess who's with me? Mm -hmm. God is. That's right. Boy, if I live my life like that, mm -hmm. I think I'll be a whole lot more careful, mm -hmm. but I also would be a whole lot more um, 
ready to share, mm -hmm. you know, what Jesus Christ has done with me yep. or done for me. You know, I mean, I was praying all the way up to Dartmouth the other day, yesterday, when I went to meet with this guy and, and praying all the way up. And as we were there, I don't think I was there five minutes or six minutes. And I just looked at him and says, can I be honest with you? And he says, yeah, he says, I, I, that's what I want. I want you to be honest with me. And then I just poured my heart out how he needed to come to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. Mm -hmm. You know, and he gave me a big lumberjack kind of a guy, burly uh -huh. guy, big, one of those hugs, wow, ah! and, and, you know, and, and so, but and then just before I left, he says, do you get another one of those? Yeah, I think so. Ah! You know, but why? Because I was willing to be honest with him. Mm-hmm. Share with him the gospel. Share with him his need. Mm -hmm. And God has prepared his heart all the way up there. Mm -hmm. And I really believe the Spirit of God had prepared his heart right. to receive what was done. That's what has to be done. And to me, when he's crying out in verse 145, I cry out with my whole heart, you know, and I'll keep your statutes and so forth. And I think a lot of it is because of the people who were causing him mischief in 150. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's that's... Mm -hmm. A thought that I've just had with all of this. Yeah, but what I love about that aspect of your commandments are truth. Um, truth is, again, this is not based on what our world defines truth as today, yeah. which is relative, which is an oxymoron. But <laughs> what you're saying here is that truth is, in all circumstances, truth is true. It's steadfast, it's immovable, it's unshakable, it can be counted on. Truth can be trusted. And and that's what this individual found with you. When you were willing to say what needed to be said, whether it was hard or not, yep. when he identified and saw as what it was being truth, he was something he could grab hold of, it's something he could count on, it's something that was dependable. And that's what he's saying here is despite all the stuff going on, despite the turmoil going on in my life, and despite how weak I might feel in the moment, I know you're true. I know that you're steadfast. I know that you, your testimonies will always remain forever and ever. They've been long, long before time, and they'll exist long after the scroll of time has been rolled up. And as long as I hold on to that, I can't go wrong because everything else will fail but that. So in saying your commandments are always true, kind of ties right into John 8, verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Set make you free. you free. Verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free, what? Absolutely. Absolutely. Indeed. indeed. And you know something? That is exactly it. And I really think that that's the heart of 145 through 152. Mm -hmm. You know, Lord, you've set me free. I'm crying out to you, set me free. And I think that's found in the word quicken. Mm -hmm. Quicken me. Yeah. Make me alive. Yeah. Set me free. Yeah. You know. Always remembering that when we cry out, don't cry out regarding the circumstances. Cry out for your God. Yeah. And that's the difference. Yeah. And in recognizing him for who he is. Uh, not that he, you know, not for what he can give you, mm -hmm. not for what but just just for who he is. Yeah. His holiness, his wonderfulness. I'm Pastor Harold Noyes, pastor of the Community Christian Church. We're located on the Lower Road in Athens, Vermont. We have morning worship at 9.30 every Sunday morning. We'd love to have you come on out if you're in the area. Come on out, sing God's praises to us. Um, just lift up his name and then, of course, a message from the Word of God. We also have an evening service at 6 p.m. We have Bible study during the week. We have prayer meeting at the church on Wednesday night at 7. Love to have you come and just spend some time with us. And also in the Charlestown area, Life on Main meets at the old... The, why do I always want to say that? It, it's not that it, the people are old. It's um, The building is old. Uh, but, but it is the senior center. But it is the senior center. So the Charlestown Senior Center is where we meet at 223 Old Springfield Road there in Charlestown. We would love to have you come out Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. We also have a coffee hour at 10 just to be able to hang out and fellowship together. Again, just like with Pastor Harold's church, just seeking God, great time in the world, word together, as well as Bible studies during the week. So call the office if you'd like to get hooked up with one of those. We do want to thank everyone for tuning into this broadcast. Again, thanking Fact TV for all of their hard work to make this possible. Um, and you can see this broadcast on the community TV stations on the South 
eastern border of Vermont, southwestern border of New Hampshire. And uh, so we encourage you to tune in there or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Heartline Ministries or on our YouTube channel at bit.ly slash Heartline Ministries. You can also get our podcast on your favorite podcast provider, whether it's Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, any of those, you can find us there as well. So we want to thank you so much and tune in next week for another um, lesson, actually be stanza number 20 in Psalm 119.